A couple of days ago, I was playing a video game called Midnight Suns, which is just a Marvel game. And so you've got Captain America, Su uh, not Superman, Spider-Man, and you know X-Men, all that. And my six-year-old, he's sitting there with me watching me play this game. And his favorite superhero is Spider-Man. So Spider-Man comes on the screen, and immediately he starts fanboying next to me. Like, he's freaking out. He's very excited. And I can't really capture the energy of a six-year-old, but it was something like this. He was just kind of going, be Spider-Man, be Spider-Man. He's the best, right? OK, you know a six-year-old, right? And so he, he, it was a great moment. I loved it. Um, it was very cute. And later on, I was kind of thinking about it. And as a six-year-old, man, we yearn, right? We yearn to be Spider-Man, to be able to have those abilities, those powers, to be able to do good, to save people, um, to be able to beat the bad guys, right? We have that yearning. As adults, I don't think that yearning really goes away. It just changes a little bit but we still yearn to have the power to do good, to make a change, to be able to do something. Spider-Man has this saying, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Today we're gonna talk about power. And power is just the capacity to influence others or events. And the world looks at power really from two perspectives. The world will tell us that power is the goal. It's kind of the first perspective. Our, I mean, our American culture glorifies power and wealth and fame and the accumulation of these things. And perhaps even for the best of intentions, you know, people want to make a difference. But the idea is that we got to get as much power as we can and just kind of hold on to it and get more and more and more. Power is the goal. The problem, though, is that that idea that that power is the goal, goes hand in hand with another thought that no matter how much power I have, it's never enough. I always got to go and get more of it. And so it creates this need within us to always chase after power and pursue it. And that leads down a path that sometimes goes to at any means necessary even. And so then we chase after power at the expense of what's right. I mean, humanity's entire history is littered with so many examples of the failure when we lust after power. The second camp that the world kind of views power through is this idea that power is evil. And this is actually gaining a lot more popularity, especially now with, with our younger generations, where it's this, this idea that any collection of power within an institution or an individual is just going to result in corruption. You can't escape it. The, the mentality, the rhetoric that all of Washington, D.C. is corrupt and that there's nothing good coming out of there or the idea that every single billionaire in the world has to be just a bad person because you can't be a billionaire and be a good person. Like This idea continues to gain steam within our culture. This idea that material wealth, getting wealth, is just not a good thing because it will make you a bad person over time. It, and it stems from this idea that getting power will result in corruption and that we fear that we will abuse any power that we get. And so this fear of the abuse of power leads to this idea that all power must be evil and we need to get rid of it. Well, often what that means is that then individuals who kind of view power from this way will take power and set it aside saying, I don't want to abuse it, but it's not like the power just goes away. Somebody else is going to pick it up, and too often those individuals do abuse it. So the world's kind of got these two viewpoints, that power's the goal or it's evil and we should stay away from it. So what's God's perspective? How does God view power? Well, God's perspective is that power is a means of grace. Now, a means of grace is any avenue in which God conveys grace. And I'm going to define grace as an unmerited experience of God's goodness. And so when I say power is a means of grace, I mean that power is an avenue in which God can convey unmerited goodness to people. 
And we often focus on the personal part when we talk about the means of grace. We, we focus on the personal grace that we experience, whether that's salvific grace, uh, which is the greatest grace we can have, or the grace that we receive through, you know, personal methods of relationship with God, whether it's prayer, you know, the uh, communion, baptism, or reading scripture, you know, those are special means of grace in which we experience God's goodness. And that's really good to focus on those things on a personal level. However, there's a broader application for the phrase means of grace, a broader application that involves the entire world. Because the church is the world's primary means of grace. What I mean by this is that God's people All of God's people are to be an avenue in which God can allow the world to experience his goodness, even while they may reject him, even while they may reject us. In his letter, James calls Christians to personal godliness, to a high level of personal godliness, but he's writing to the church as a whole. He addresses it to all Christians, the church collectively, because the church, when the church is holding itself personally to high levels of godliness, then the entire world is going to be affected by that. The entire world will experience unmerited love and favor and the goodness of God because of the godliness that we show personally. Power is a means of grace. So if we think of it practically for us, like what's that really mean for me today, right now? Power as a means of grace means that how we wield our power that we have in this life, the influence that we have, ought to bring unmerited experience of God's goodness to every single person around us. Whether they're part of the church or not. Our series that we're in right now, Real Talk, is a thematic view of the book of James. We're going through a lot of the major themes that we see in this letter. And handling power is one of the biggest. James talks about the rich and the poor in multiple places. If you're reading through James with us over the summer, which I hope you are, then you have noticed this. He talks about the rich and the poor all the time. Now, the context he's writing in is rising political and social tensions as wealthy landowners are oppressing and abusing the poor working class. And they're just taking their rights away. And in his day, wealth equated power, which is still pretty true for us even now. So as we read through James, we can replace the word rich with powerful and poor with powerless, and that will help you understand some of the underlying context in which James is writing this letter as he's writing it to the church. And James recognizes that individuals that he's writing to, because he's writing to Christians, individuals that he's writing to are going to experience both power and powerlessness. They will have power in some instances, and they will not in others. Uh, For example, in the early church, You could have had somebody who was part of that poor working class, and so they had no power really in their employment. They were at the whim of the wealthy landowner and everything. But they would go into the church, and they could be a deacon or an elder and have all the power in those four walls. And so James understands that as a reality. For us today, that's still true. We have power in many parts of our lives, and There's also many parts of our lives where we don't have as much power, or we may even feel completely powerless. Perhaps, you know, at work, you're just on the team. You just come in, you're not management of any kind, and you're told what to do, you do it, and you go home. You really don't have a lot of power at your job, but perhaps you're a parent, and you come home, and all of a sudden, you have complete, total power over your kids. Or perhaps you're a student. And you really feel, I don't have a lot of power at all. (laughs) Because you have to live under your parents' roof. You have to do what they say. You have to go to class. You have to do all that stuff. But the reality is, even students, like, you have power within your circle of friends or online or your other avenues of social life. There's influence that you wield even in those areas. We have power in some places, and we're powerless in others. And that's just a reality for all of us. And let's be really honest 
we live in Fishers or the surrounding areas, uh, Indiana, the United States, we, by the very nature of being able to live here, mean that we have a lot more power than a lot of people in this world. We all exercise power in some ways. We all are also powerless in others. If we view power from God's perspective, that it is a means of grace, then we will live in a way that brings God's unmerited grace on all people, no matter what level of power we may experience in any given situation. Now, at the end of today, to close us out, I'm going to give you a power assessment tool. And this is simply a tool that you can use to see where you have influence and how you can use it well. I'll explain more about that at the end, but that's coming. But until then, we're going to look at just three tips that can kind of help us as we're narrowing into thinking, okay, we, we're going to apply this. We're going to look at three tips for this godly perspective on power that James gives us within his letter. Okay, so we're going to be in James 4 and 5, chapters 4 and 5. So you can go ahead and open your Bibles, load them up on your phone if you want to. There's also Bibles in front of you in many of the chairs. We're going to be in James chapter 4 and 5 mostly. Now the very first tip that James give us, gives us about power is that it's not bad to want power. It's not bad to want power or to get it, but obsessing over it is going to ruin you. Power is not a bad thing. It's not inherently bad or evil. Wealth is not bad. It's not bad to have money. If you want to see a change at your company, and you know really the only way that's going to happen is if you chase after that promotion and you get it and you make change happen, cool, go for it. Like There's nothing wrong with that. If you're familiar with the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 3, and, and it's like a personality test type thing. So I'm an Enneagram 3, and so what that means is I'm motivated a lot by status and achievement and success. Uh, I'm driven by these things. And so by nature, I'm actually a rather ambitious person. And for a long time, I struggled with the idea that I was ambitious. I struggled with that because... I saw a disconnect, I, I was incorrect, but I saw a disconnect between my faith as a Christian and this idea that I'm ambitious. I, I thought, these don't go together, and I, and I really struggled with it. Thankfully, through a lot of wisdom from other people and, and God's word and a lot of prayer, I realized that my ambition isn't bad as long as I keep it in its proper place. Power is ultimately the Lord's, no matter how much you have or how little you may have. When we obsess over gaining power, though, that is when we begin walking on a path that will ruin us. In chapter 4, starting at verse 1, James says, What is causing the quarrels and the fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? The evil desires he's talking about is this lust after worldly things, lust after worldly power. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it, and even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Lust after power leads to terrible things. And our hearts, in that process, as we focus so much on gaining more and more power, our hearts become so focused on ourselves that there's no room for anybody else in the world, let alone God. He continues in verse 4, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And when he says friendship with the world, he's talking about thinking the way that the world thinks, seeing the world from the world's perspective, thinking and lusting after power as the most important thing. I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. If you lust after power and that's all that, you're care, that you care about, then your attitudes and your actions are just going to work counter to God's, counter to his goodness. A desire for power is not bad, but when the desire for power overshadows everything else in your life, it's pretty much assured that any power that you do obtain 
you will abuse it in some way. So instead of obsessing over the accumulation of power, let's put it in its proper place as a means of grace. The second tip that he gives us is to recognize that as a part of all of this, that justice is grace. The guy who wrote this is James, and his nickname was James the Just. It should be no surprise that justice plays a prominent role within his letter. James expected the church to act in a godly way at all times, across every single area of their life, not just within the church, but outside the church, within their culture and within their society. And not just for their benefit, but for the benefit of the entire world. He wanted to create goodness, God's kind of goodness, for all people, no matter what. And the truth is that the powerful already have it pretty good most of the time. The world is bent toward those who already hold a lot of power. Whether we're talking about disability, wealth, race, gender, age, whatever we talk about, whatever subject it may be. It's the marginalized, the voiceless, that need to have a little bit more acknowledgement for what they're going through. That we put a little extra effort into making sure that we're wielding our power well. Now, we can talk about these lofty ideas of justice, and you, and you may be sitting there thinking, well, yeah, absolutely, like, I'm not going to fight you on the idea that things should be just, but it's so big. I mean, what can we really do about it? And so the very first step is what James gives us. He gives us a very easy first step into really what it means to pursue justice, and that is a high level of personal godliness. Having a high level of personal godliness, having high character, will protect you from abusing whatever power you may have and responding well in situations in which you don't have a lot of power. When one is godly, those who have power and are godly, they're going to wield the power that they have in redemptive, just, and merciful ways. Just as God the Father, in his complete, powerful existence, who has sovereignty over all things, he acts for all people for their good. And when we find ourselves without power and we are powerless in certain situations in life, we can engage in our circumstances with grace, patience, with mercy, and with love as a reflection of Jesus who gave up all power that he had to be here on earth and to die for us. James 2, 1 through 13, you don't need to turn there, we're going to be there just shortly, but James 2, 1 through 13 is an example of what happens when we neglect godly character, even within the church. In this part of the text, James lays out two people showing up at a church. One is rich and put together, and, and it's obvious, and the other person is poor, and they're not so put together, and that's also obvious. The church takes the rich person and gives them all the benefits and caters to their needs and neglects the poor person completely. James doesn't say exactly why this happens, but if we look at the entire letter as a whole, the message tells us that the church member is looking to cater to the individual that they know can bring the most wealth and power back to the church disregarding the person that they felt like they couldn't get anything out of. Our modern American church really isn't immune to that temptation or that sin. I've seen it, you've seen it way too often, where it's all about what money we can bring in to the church or, or how much influence we can have over politics. Or perhaps it's really just the idea that we need to appease the majority within our congregation so that, you know, we don't ruffle any feathers and that means that we're just going to ignore all the issues that don't have to do with our majority and that means that we end up neglecting or even rejecting the poor, the powerless, the minority, the immigrant, anyone who's just a little different. 
all just for the sake of holding on to whatever power we may think we have and create comfortable bubbles of existence for us. It's so easy to forget justice when it's not our immediate problem. Check out James' blunt words in chapter 5, starting at verse 1. James says, look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you are counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. James straight up calls out the injustices that people within his church, Christians, are perpetuating and allowing He pulls no punches. He's rather harsh. I'm not going to pull any punches either this morning. This is way too important for us to talk about. If you have power in your life, in any area of life, at work, at home, with friends, online, with our culture, if you hold power over others, you better be honoring them in just and merciful and gracious, godly ways, pursuing justice so that all people may have unmerited experiences of God's goodness, whether they're part of our church or not. Even if it's not really necessarily your problem. And that might require great personal sacrifice to yourself, to your wallet, to your influence. And if you have limited power in your life, you may be powerless in some areas, then you better be conducting yourself in godly ways, no matter what. Especially as you speak out against the injustices that you face or other people face in their lives. Because otherwise, your message of justice and goodness will be drowned out by your ungodliness. And sometimes we fail to do this well. Maybe you've just never really thought about it before, the power that you have, the power that you wield in this world. Or sometimes you willfully ignore it. Or if we're really honest with ourselves, perhaps we even revel in the power that we hold over others. Or we like to pretend like we don't have any power at all because we love to play the victim and to complain about our entire life. We all fail at times to handle our power and our powerlessness well. And I'm guilty as the next, more so than so many, because, I mean, look at me. I obviously have enjoyed the advantageous side of privilege my entire life. And I didn't really intend to do this, but, I mean, even the way I'm dressed, I could have a captain's hat and come right off my yacht. (laughs) I have failed before and I will fail again to handle and to hold the reality of my life well when it comes to this. But the cool thing is that God doesn't leave us in that. He gives us a way forward, a hopeful way forward. And that's our third tip that he gives us in James, that when we do fail, we just grieve and repent. And then we can move on and move forward. If we go back to chapter 4, starting at verse 7, he says, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. 
Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Failing doesn't disqualify you from God's grace, but it also doesn't give you a free pass to just ignore it. But here in chapter 4, in these verses, we see a path toward repentance. And repentance is the only way, the, the way that we can have godly action in our life. It's only through repentance, which is turning away from those bad actions and going toward godly actions. And, those, and that path is, is simple. It's just really four steps that I see. Humbly acknowledge your failure. Two, grieve your sin. Really grieve your sin and the world's brokenness as a whole. And then repent and choose to see the world through God's eyes from his perspective and choose his way. And then humbly look for ways that you can practically right now spread God's goodness to this world. Ways in which your power right now can be a means of grace. All right, I'm going to now give you that power assessment tool that I told you about. This is a very practical tool that I've used in my life in, in many different areas, in, in my family, my work, my extended family, uh, my friend circles. I use it to focus my attention and really see how I can use the influence that God has blessed me with in, in good, healthy ways to actually make a difference where I'm at right now. And so there's really two sections to this. So first you pick a part of your life, whatever it may be, work, family, whatever. So you pick one area, and then you ask the question, what needs to be done? And so what needs to be done is really just these three things, okay? They're all, all negative. We're looking for good and bad, right? So what's good that needs to be encouraged? So like if you're like your job, what's good at my job that should be encouraged? What's broken that needs to be fixed? What's missing that needs to be created? And so we just kind of go through that real quick, and you think, okay, of this area of my life, how can I answer these questions? And then the next part is, how can I do something about it? What can I do to do one of these things, to fix this, or to encourage it, or to create something? And those are some simple questions to help you understand the influence that you actually do have in life. Because like I said earlier, we all have some kind of influence or power. We just sometimes need to recognize it. So A, like what knowledge or experience have I accumulated? What skills do I have? What key people do I know? Who are they? How can they help me achieve some of these goals? Where do I have recognized authority? Where do I have influence? Where do I have a good reputation? And from where can my voice be heard? From what platform do I have? A friend of mine, he did this, this exact assessment just earlier this year. He is an actuary in Indianapolis, and if you don't know what an actuary is, that's okay, I didn't really either. Um, an actuary is simply kind of a math guy at, um, who does risk assessments, okay? So math guy, risk assessments. There was an actuary in first service, and he gave me the nod of approval, so that's close enough at least to make sense. So this guy, he's mid-20s, um, I don't think he's even 25 yet, but he uh, he's an actuary in Indianapolis, and he was really struggling with the idea of being an actuary and how that really made a difference, because he's just working with numbers all day in an office. He doesn't see an impact on the world, and he's just working for a major company. And he also wanted to know, how does my faith even tie in with my work? And he really struggled with this for a long time. So he did this assessment, and through the assessment, he found that his work, some of the really good things they had was that there was good team dynamics between his actuary team and then all the actuary teams because it's a big company. And so there's really good team dynamics and he had a really good relationship with his boss. Like that was a relationship, that was someone he knew that could really help him, right? So he's, he's finding these things, but he also found something that was a little bit broken in his company and it was that they had a lot of cool charitable things that they sponsored, but as an actuary, just working there every day, he had nothing to do with them. He, he didn't know or was involved really in any of the charitable work that the company had. So he decided, you know what, I can actually wield some of the influence I have with my team to do something about this. And so he started a diaper drive this year. 
And they just did that a couple of months ago. They started a dry, diaper drive where the actuary teams competed against one another to just have a fun, you know, experience to raise diapers. They ended up raising nearly 28,000 diapers in just a couple of months. It was so successful that his company then matched their donation. It doubled immediately. And in fact, the company is now looking at the model that they use, just their actuary teams, to spread across all their branches and across the entire nation to get everyone within their company more involved with charitable work within their local communities. My friend did this, and he wielded his seemingly very limited power, and he ended up making a huge impact here in Indianapolis that might even spread across the entire nation. As my six-year-old may say, he chose just to be Spider-Man in a moment. Imagine Imagine what you could do if you decided to use your power, the influence you have in your life, to bring grace to other people, to recognize and harness your influence, to, to bring goodness to the lives of those in your community and in, in your surrounding area and this world. Imagine what you could do if you just decided to be Spider-Man. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and how you remind us that we have so much to offer, so much to give this world, and it's all part of your plan. And Lord, you empower us and you equip us to be able to do that. So Father, we thank you that we have that opportunity, and we ask humbly that you reveal to us ways in which we can recognize, first off, our power, know where we do have influence and power that we can wield, and then help us to know very practical, real ways in which we can do something with it, that we can wield our power and bring goodness, unmerited goodness, to our communities, to our world around us. Lord, help us to be Spider-Man. In your name, amen.